All right, so I'm gonna uh, introduce our speaker who's coming down the stairs. And uh, yes, please do applaud, please do. Um, uh, <clears throat> so. <laughs> Uh, so, um, great. Um, just a few minutes, if you'll indulge me. Um, people know the importance that uh, Drosophila played in the role of uh, study of genetics. Well, uh, the monarch has played the role in the field of chemical ecology. And Dr. Brower was one of the pioneers in the field of chemical ecology. Ecology is one of those fields that's um, uh, one of the few fields that's more broad than entomology. And um, the uh, uh, pioneering work that uh, Dr. Brower did, uh, simply put, was uh, uh, based on uh, the chemistry of a plant and the insect that fed on that plant and a naive bird that fed on or tried to feed on that insect. Um, I like to think that the um, uh, multiple trophic levels of the study of uh, chemical ecology and ecology in general, in a way, uh, mimic the, the broad interests of the naturalists and the master naturalists in this room. So with that, um, I'd like everyone to give Dr. Brower applause, and um, I will go switch the um, show over. And let me hand off the scope. I'll let you put it on. Okay. Okay. One more. There we go. Okay. All right. Here we are. All right. Well, the title of my talk is The Grand Saga of the Monarch Butterfly, and it's something I've been studying since 1954. Um, and so that's, uh, I, won't, I don't even know how many years that, what, how many years is that? 60. 60. Good Lord. Anyway, it's, it's been a great, it's, <laughs> it's been a great trip. Um, what I want to start out and end up with is a discussion of what we've termed the endangered biological phenomenon. And the species is not at risk, but the phenomenon that it exhibits is at risk. And uh, examples of that are, uh, Pige the passenger pigeon was an endangered phenomenon that went extinct, and one of the really interesting, sort of frightening aspects is that the distribution of the passenger pigeon is pretty, co almost coincides with the eastern population of the monarch butterfly. Another one were bison, which were eliminated almost completely from the west, as everybody knows, and. Uh, then in Africa, this one is an endangered phenomenon, the wildebeest migrations. You've probably seen some of these wonderful African films showing these incredible beasts migrating for hundreds of miles, following the grassland around Africa. And the monarch butterfly is an endangered biological phenomenon. And I didn't think it was as endangered as it appears to be now until two years ago when things really began to get serious. So let's take a look at the migration of the butterfly. F from Maine, it's almost 2,000 miles to Mexico in a straight line, and we know they don't go in a straight line, so it's probably even further than that. And so they're migrating out of this breeding area, which is about a million square miles of breeding area in the eastern U.S., east of the Rockies, and they're headed down to Mexico to the central part right here in the transvolcanic range of Mexico which runs from east to west across, and they're right in the dead center of Mexico in a tiny area that's about 60 by 30 miles in extent. Um, and then the butterflies spend five months more or less there, and then they migrate back pretty much not too far, uh, pretty much to the Gulf Coastal states, and Texas is probably the most important state for monarchs getting reestablished in the spring. So the butterflies have migrated all the way to Mexico, spend five or six months there, then migrate back in the spring, coming through right now and then over the next few weeks to establish a new generation, and then that new generation will reestablish the butterflies across the entire eastern breeding range. It's really a very remarkable phenomenon, as we all know. 
Now, to put the whole migration in perspective, the monarch is a member of the milkweed butterfly family. Uh, this is from Acri and Vane Wright, a wonderful book called Milkweed Butterflies. There are 157 species of, mon of, of milkweed butterflies. Uh, most of them are in Africa and in Asia. Uh, there are a few in South America and three or four in, uh, in North America. But it's only, the monarch is the most famous of all these butterflies because of this phenomenal migration. And many of these butterflies do have shorter migrations or migrations up and down vertically in the mountains where they occur. So the, the tendency to move from place to place to migrate is deeply embedded in the history of the genetics of this group of butterflies. And the, the, they're called milkweed butterflies because they're all associated as larvae on plants that contain latex and which probably also contain toxins of various sorts. We'll get to that. Here you see a milkweed. This is the uh, Sand Hill milkweed in Florida, which contains an enormous amount of latex under pressure inside a separate vascular system of the plant. Uh, that, and so if anything bites it, 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 the milkweed oozes out and can trap the insects and actually glue them to the surface. So monarchs have had to overcome that, but they've done a lot more than that, as we will see. Um, so here's the breeding range in the spring, just to summarize it for you, coming back from Mexico, breeding along the Gulf Coast. We don't know whether they get across the Gulf or whether they follow along the coast. They probably follow along the coast rather than migrating across the Gulf, because they can't, they can't fly at night, as far as we know. And the straight line distance along the Gulf of Mexico is too far for them to do it in one shot without stopping on the surface of the water, which would probably be, be the end of them. So then, so the new generation builds up over the course of the summer of two or three generations for a total of maybe four, maybe partially even five in a good year. We'll, so we'll have a good year this year, so maybe they can start coming back. And why did they migrate in the first place? Well, to me, it's perfectly obvious, and I'm really concerned about people planting milkweeds of wrong species all over the place, buying seeds from California to plant them here to do good for the monarch. But we must make sure, if we're going to do this planting of milkweeds, that we plant the natives that grow in the area where you're replanting them. And there's a good reason for that, is there's, there are 108 species at least in North America, monarchs feed on all of them, and when they feed on a particular species of plant, it imparts a fingerprint in that plant, and you can actually use the chemicals in the milkweed plants to trace the movements of the butterflies. And so if, if this biogeography gets mixed up, we're going to lose a really interesting potential. Plus, if you think about the whole evolution of monarchs, they're coming out of the tropics, they're invading North America, just like songbirds, and they're taking advantage of the flush of milkweeds in the spring and then as you go further north over the course of the summer. So here was this incredible resource that the butterfly could exploit if it had a migration that would get it back into a safe place in the wintertime. It's very analogous to the warbler migration. So here, Oops, sorry. This, this is an old lady. When I was at University of Florida for several years. And nearby in Cross Creek is a wonderful field site that we've studied for about 25 years now. And here's an old lady who's overwintered in Mexico who's coming back and she's depositing an egg on Sand Hill milkweed. And it takes about three or four days for the larvae to hatch out from the eggs. Here are two eggs. They usually lay one egg but sometimes too, unless something is wrong with them, they never dump their eggs on the plants. If they do dump an egg, they're either old butterflies or they're diseased. Um, and the, the, the egg hatches out in three or four days. The caterpillar eats down the shell. And if this is bad news for this guy because this one's going to turn on it and think it's eating its own egg shell and will continue and will cannibalize the other egg. So, there's a good density-dependent population <laughs> control if there are too many monarchs. They eat each other up. And about 10 days later, the caterpillar is fully grown. This is on a California milkweed, where I, I was at Davis for a year sabbatical. 
and we did a lot of work with this Asclepius area carpa. So in about two weeks, the, the caterpillar has grown an enormous extent, feeding on milkweeds. Then, as you know, it spins up and it turns into this beautiful jade-colored chrysalis. One of the things, if you go back in the old literature, is how does the caterpillar not fall off the plant when it has to ha turn from the caterpillar to the chrysalid? And this is a little distraction I just want to show you. Well, that, this is a beautiful picture by Marie in Milan that I showed. So about a week later, depending on the weather, it's ready to hatch out. I'll get to the, the caterpillar story in a second. I always overjump these things. So this beautiful butterfly hatches out, and here its wings haven't dried. It takes two or three hours for the wings to dry, and then it's made in flight, and then it gets back into the, the life cycle. And, and it's sort of incredible to think a butterfly that is delicate as this can actually fly for about 4,000 mile round trip in the course of its life. Well, here is the caterpillar spun up on this little silk pad that before it, as, as it's getting ready to metamorphose to the chrysalid, it walks up on the leaf and it spins this little silk pad. And then it attaches hooks to the base of it and then it has to shed that skin and let go of the silk pad without falling off the silk pad. How about that? It's pretty tricky. So here you see the caterpillar is wiggling, it's breaking its skin. Its skin is coming up. Here is the silk pad. Here's the base, the hind legs. Closer. It's holding on like dear life. And the skin is coming up. And now it's got to let go. And it pulls out this special organ, which is called a cremaster. Can you see it there? And the cream master has these beautiful little hooks on it, and it jams those hooks into the silk, and it rotates around and anchors the silk, the cream master into the silk pad. All's gone well, and this is what it looks like under an electron microscope. You can see these little hooks, and here's the silk pad. And if you look at it under high power, it really is pretty fantastic. The, 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 if you look closely at these animals, as we all know in this room, they're just the fantastic creatures in so many different ways. Well, going back into the last century, uh, the English naturalists who were great butterfly collectors noticed that some groups of butterflies had beak marks on their wings. And when they looked at it a little more carefully, they could figure out what bird had actually attacked the butterfly and they formulated a hypothesis that Danaean butterflies and milkweed butterflies were frequently, uh, had these Im imprints of beak marks on them. And they hypothesized that the bird had, had caught the butterfly and tasted it and let it go because it was unpalatable. And then they put together the bigger picture and realized that monarchs are all, all of the Danaeids are associated with milkweeds most milkweeds are toxic, and the hypothesis was that the caterpillar is picking up the poisons from the milkweed, transferring it into the adult tissues and the larval tissues. Well, so that's what got me started on the monarch in the first place. Um, sorry. And so here, here's a monarch feeding on a toxic milkweed, and then we got our birds in the lab trained to eat butterflies and offered them the butterfly that was raised on the toxic milkweed. It takes it typically, pecks off the wings, pecks off the legs, off the antennae, then swallows the abdomen, and about five <laughs> minutes later, <laughs> and 12 minutes later. <laughs> so this, this is, if I have any fame, it's Brower's barfing blue jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it turns out that this is what Mike was saying in that very nice introduction. Thank you, Mike. Um, that the poisons that are in milkweeds are related to digitoxin, which is used in the treatment of human heart disease. And they're very similar. They're just a little isometrically different. And what is really interesting is that, that these cardenolides or cardiac glycosides, these milkweed poisons, they have three effects. First of all, they're very bitter tasting. And secondly, they cause vomiting. And thirdly, they affect the, 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 the uh, heart beat rate. 
And so for people who have fluttering hearts, if you take digitoxin, it restores your heart to normalcy, provided you don't take too much. And if you do, you're a barfing blue jay. <laughs> but what is really interesting is that they're also very bitter. So if a bird learns that a monarch is gonna make it sick, and then it beak marks it, it's gonna be reminded if it forgets that the bitterness, I shouldn't, I shouldn't go any further. So it's a really ecologically a very interesting uh, system. Well, in the 1970s, my lab addressed the population level questions about monarch butterfly defenses. We wanted to, it was, discovering that it really is true was a, very exciting, but then what, how does this work in the, in the natural world? And we ground up butterflies that had been raised on different milkweed species. And this is a butterfly <laughs> that's just gone from my days of a butterfly collector grinding them up to this extent. Anyway, we put that in a gelatin capsule, force-fed it very gently to the blue jay. <laughs> and what we found was that monarchs reared on, on the sandhill milkweed have enough poison in one butterfly to make eight blue jays vomit, eight, <laughs> eight emetic units. And then this plant had fewer and fewer and fewer and much to our surprise, a tropical milkweed, which we thought was going to be super toxic, had no cardinalides in it at all and produced completely palatable butterflies. And I didn't tell you this, but that was how we duped the blue jays into eating monarch butterflies. We raised them on non-toxic milkweeds. <laughs> then we could get them to eat the, the, toxic, uh, the butterflies raised on toxic milkweed. So, So we then developed an assay which actually measured the amount of poison in individual butterflies. And what we found was, uh, and by force feeding the powders, we were able to determine that if, if butterflies raised on the very common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, in Massachusetts, fall migrants, about 46% of them have enough poison to cause uh, the, the birds to vomit. And the other half goes down to subemetic, down to being basically completely palatable. So there's a palatability spectrum out there in the wild world. And just as we were doing this, um, I think I skipped the slide, but it doesn't really matter. Um, just at the height of working on this chemical ecology in, in uh, California with my colleague Jim Seiber and Carolyn Nelson, uh, Professor Urquhart published the wonderful article in the National Geographic magazine in August 1976. And on the picture, I guess you all know that Kat Catalina lives in, in Austin, Texas, and she's gonna be here tomorrow night. And we're gonna have a round table discussion, which should be really fun. And anyway, uh, so this was a momentous discovery. And because of the variability of the uh, toxicity of monarch butterflies, I was really eager to get to the Mexican area to find that, to get samples of monarch butterflies so we could see how palatable they were and so we could fingerprint them and see where the butterflies were coming from. This is one of the areas, the most very beautiful area, Sara Pailon, uh, aerial photograph. This is, this is an uh, absolutely gorgeous area and it is the mountain range upon which Catalina and Ken Brueger found the monarchs. So we'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow night. So since 1977, we have studied the ecology. Once I saw those butterflies, I realized that this is an endangered biological phenomenon. Here they are, the whole North American population is staring you in the face, sitting right in front of you on a wall of butterflies. And so I got very interested in why are the butterflies going to these forests? How does the forest protect the butterflies? Uh, and what threats are there to the forest? Because if you destroy the overwintering habitat, the butterfly will have had it. So I moved to the University of Florida to be closer to the butterflies. We took a whole number of expeditions down to Mexico. We camped out and worked and my graduate students were down there for up to three or four months at a time tracking what's going on. Now, the butterflies are going as we, as down along the coast of the Sierra Madre Mountains through Texas in the fall, and they're ending up right here in this very central small part of Mexico. 
And if you look at this vegetation map, you can see where the yellow circle is circling some black areas. And those black areas represent high elevation fir forests, the Abies religiosa or Oyamel fir. And that is the preferred overwintering tree that monarchs spend the winter on. And it's very, very small distribution. And so, and so basically these forests were probably more widespread in the Pleistocene and as things warmed up, the forest retreated up the mountains, and so they're now rel relictual forests on top of these beautiful mountains. And so there are not very many of them, and that's the prime habitat of overwintering monarch butterflies. And here you see another aerial photograph of the Sierra Chinqua that goes up to about 11,000 feet in the top here. And if you look, there's a very dark green foliage is all Oyamel firs, the, the green coming up at, at slightly lower, up to about 10,000 feet elevation are pines. Then it's a mixture, and then you get into these pure Oyamel forests. And the butterflies, uh, the second colony that was discovered was discovered right in this valley here called Zapatero Canyon on, on the, on the, um, on the Sierra Chinqua. It's just a beautiful part of the world. And here is the, here is the uh, Rosario colony. There are about 12 different mountains that have butterflies on them now that we know about. And here you can see a colony, which is the Normaus. This is the football field in the United States, and that's the outline of that colony. So it was the equivalent of about three or four football fields. Here you see them coming in with the volcanic mountains in the background coming in, this would be in, in uh, November. They come in and they come in, they orient to the tree tops and then they drop down lower on the trees and eventually the whole colonies move down into sheltered valleys as the season wears on. Looking up, here's an OML fir tree that's almost completely covered except for the top. And there, within it, one of these bags would be two or 3,000 monarch butterflies. And they also form on cedar trees and they form on pine, they'll fo form on pine. Here, here they're on a, a Oyamel bough. They're sunny and they're, they're displaying their colors to more extent. And some of these, these uh, bags of butterflies are just unbelievably dense. You, have, how many people have been to Mexico to see the butterflies? Quite a, so you've seen these wonderful, uh, incredible concentrations. It's just marvelous. And they also form on the tree trunks. And after storms knock them down, they crawl. They too, too cold to fly, but they'll crawl up any tree trunk. So usually there has been a storm if you see a lot of butterflies on the tree trunks. Well, um, Bill Calvert and I got together um, and started doing a lot of field work in Mexico. Is Bill here tonight by any chance? He's coming in tomorrow. Oh, he's coming in tomorrow, good. Excellent. Well, anyway, Bill is a marvelous field biologist, and, and we had many good years working together in Mexico. And what Bill did, first of all, we, after, after Bill discovered the first site known to my group in December of 1976, and then I was with him, we went back again in the middle of January that year. And what Bill then took off with some of my assistants, and they located, sorry, what he did was he, he walked around the colonies and he measured the angle and calculated the area of the colonies. And that has become the standard way of measuring how many butterflies there are because there's another reason that I'll tell you, there's 50 million butterflies per hectare. I'll tell you how we get to that number. But uh, so by knowing the number of hectares and measuring them objectively in this way, you can compare the numbers from each colony from within a year and from year to year to year. So that's what the basis of the numbers are that when we see this de uh, decline in monarch butterflies, the total number of hectares have been going down, down, down. Um, so we visited as many colonies as we could. We looked for them. And basically this is our, one of our early papers. These were colonies in, in the early days of 1976, I think this was, or 77. There were two colonies in Chinqua and then the three other colonies, and this, this was the sizes of them. And so we did that for as many of the mountain ranges as we could find. And basically, 
the numbers have jumped around for, over the period that we have really good data. There were more earlier than there are now, for sure. And there were more earlier. This graph, if we could go over here, would be starting out in 1976. But anyway, you can see they jump around, and we'll talk about the decline, but they jump around from a few hectares to about, about one, from a maximum of 21 in 96, 97, and that was a real year. Well, I'm certain that that number was not overestimated. And then, it's, then this is the pattern. So we have a good handle to measure what's happening from year to year to year. So the questions that Bill and I got really interested in is why do the monarchs come to these high elevation fir forests? What, what is it about this special habitat? Well, uh, I, uh, over the years, I've become very good friends with a colleague at NASA by the name of Dan Slayback, who's a GIS expert and really good at, at uh, flying and figuring out where anything is anywhere on this planet, as far as I can tell. Anyway, Dan and I flew over this area and then we got these satellite images. And this is the monarch butterfly region. We'll come back to that later. But the black line there is above 10,000 feet. And if you, you're gonna see the red spots on this map are where the butterfly colonies have been found and recorded over the years. Now the next slide is gonna show exactly the same area during a moist period when water, when moisture is coming off the Pacific Ocean and the winds are blowing over the mountains. That's why the monarchs are there. They're going for the, the moisture at that high elevation in this very dry part of Mexico. And here you, this was taken during one of these moist storms. Looking southwest, the clouds are forming as the, as the wind blows up and it, it cools and it condenses and the water forms and clouds form on the mountaintop. And here you see the clouds blowing. The colony is right up here. And this is inside the colony during one of these adiabatic phenomena with a with condensation of the, of the fog on the butterflies. And they can drink water off of each other during these, these uh, events. It's really, and you can see droplets of water on the butterflies, which are here. And on the, you, can you see those little silver droplets? So this is special, having it that high elevation in that climate at the height of the dry season, you can get these adiabatic events when the butterflies won't desiccate. Um, so the monarch wintering area in Mexico is shown completely on this map. It's about 60 miles this way and a maximum of 30 this way. So it, it's a tiny area and the area, and then it's only on the mountain tops where the butterfly forests are occurring. And so in about 10 years ago, one of the questions that we asked, well, it's so hard to get into these sites, very, very difficult terrain and difficult politically to get into the areas. So we decided we wanted to fly over the areas and see if we could find more butterfly sites. And Dan was really good at spotting them from an airplane, a small airplane. And a group called Lighthawk, which is a group of uh, environmental people who donate their planes and pilots, flew us all over the place. And guess how many sites we found in addition to the 12 known sites? Zero. Much to my surprise. I figured we knew what the, what the combination was, where the site should be. We didn't find any more butterflies. So it appears to be really a limited phenomenon. Here we are flying in this little plane. There's Dan plotting our course, and he was really good at spotting butterflies flying. And this is what you see from the air. This was the Arroyo Honda on the Chinqua. And here is the colony here. On a, on a clear day when the sun is out, the butterflies open their wings and they're orange and they're a lot easier to see. So the best flying conditions are when it's clear. And this is looking a little more closely at that colony. And you can see the OEMLs and a few pines, the greener trees of the pine, covered with monarchs. And here is a small, uh, this is on Cerro Pelon, and you can't really see the colony very well, but it's right in here. It's right there, and there's a blow up, and you can see the orange color on the trees. And that was a, a one hectare colony, a, a pretty small colony, actually. And here was an even smaller colony, a fifth of a hectare, 
and this one was lit up so that you could really see it. And notice that the butterflies are avoiding the treetops. They're not on the treetops. They're concentrated about a third of the way down the trees, and then about, and you'll see more about that later and why. And here's another, here's another colony. This one is on Mille Cumbres, and this was a really tiny colony, less than a, a, a tenth of a hectare, but, but you can see it right here. And this is one that was about a fifth of a hectare, a really beautiful, typical colony with super concentration on the lower parts of the trees. And here's one more on Palomas, another small colony, and it's right in this area here. So you could either see them by looking out of the window of the airplane uh, flying, or you could see them see the colony itself. And if you could spot them flying, we could then usually find the colony. So that was very exciting and very, really nice to be able to do that. So what are the challenges to winter survival? Desiccation that we've mentioned, uh, predation by birds, freezing, and starvation. I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but have you done some really nice work on Texas about that last couple of years ago? Well, this is the, this is the, we've set up a weather station that we've run for about nine years now. And what this shows is it's the amount of rainfall starting in November, December, January, February, March. And it just gets dry, 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 dry. And this is the summer wet season, and it's really wet. And this is the next dry season. And the green line on these is the time of when the monarchs are actually there. So that they're out there at the beginning of the dry season, and it's just getting drier and drier and drier, and they get out of there about the middle of March at the height of the dry season. And here you can see the Llanos of the Three Governors on Cerro Pelon and see how dry it is. This would have been in, uh, when was that? February 2013, about a year ago I took that picture. This year it was much greener at the same time. But that gives you an idea just how dry it gets. The butterflies respond to the drought by flying out of the colonies for up to a mile or two to drink water. And here you see them flying across the Yano Three Governors. And if, if you walked out to the right and looked back, you'd see one, one stream of butterflies were going out, and higher up another stream was coming back. I mean, just it's such a phenomenal butterfly. All these things it does is just so wonderful. And here they are going down to a stream uh, that's along a road. It was, the water was coming down there, and there were just millions of butterflies drinking water. And here they are all down near these seeps. So fresh water is, re here you see a female which is tanking up on water, and here's her proboscis dipped into the water. Um, some of these butterflies get so tanked up in water, you wonder how they actually can fly back to the colony but apparently they do. So one of the reasons I wanted to go to Mexico in the first place was because we, we, rumors were out that there was predation going on, and so they're supposed to be protected, right? So they should be, uh, the birds shouldn't be eating them, but are the birds eating them? Well, we'll find out. Birds were eating the butterflies by the thousands, and they were dropping out of the trees and falling on our heads. This is a monarch which has recently been killed. It has no head. The bird pecked its head off. And as you'll see later, it found it unpalatable and didn't eat it. And the two birds which we discovered, which were primary uh, predators, were the black-headed grosbeak, female here. And they fly in mixed flocks. And the orioles fly in with them. And they just go at the clusters and they, they sort the butterflies, eating the good ones and dropping the bad ones. <laughs> so they're on to the business. They're on, they're, the birds have figured out what's going on. So we, we wanted to measure that. So Bill and I set up this experiment with our colleagues. Uh, here is uh, <coughs> Lindsay. Uh, I forget his first name, but he was, the, he was the wonderful Texan who was with us, who helped keep us out of trouble. He was a wonderful guy. Anyway, we made these one meter nets, nets and we hung out a hundred of them in the colony underneath the clusters. The idea was to catch butterflies that the birds are dropping into the nets. 
and any that fell in just by any other means, we would sort through and then we counted the number of birds that were predated per net per day. And this is what we found. We did this in 1979. Um, this, the, the black hatched area represents times of Montezuma's revenge. So their averages for those days. Anyway, the number of butterflies killed per meter squared per day. If you go over to this, it goes from zero to, what is that? How about is that? 35, it goes from zero to 35,000. And so the, this is the number of birds that are being, bu butterflies that are being killed by the birds per day. And what is really interesting about this graph is that we analyze it really carefully with time series analysis. And there's a 6.8 day period where there's high to low, to high to low every, every seven days. And if you study the rate at which digitoxin is excreted from the body, 50% of it is excreted over the course of 6.8 days. So what's happening is the birds are coming in, eating up and then beginning, some of them are getting enough toxin that they're probably getting sick. So they drop down and don't come in as many numbers. Well, where should I point this thing? See, we point, oh, there we go. So anyway, uh, why are, how can the birds eat so many of these chemically defended butterflies? So what happened? I went backwards, didn't I? No, wait a minute. Sorry, I went ahead. Okay, so my wife Linda and I did a study in 1981 where we actually observed the birds. We collected the butterflies as they dropped them, and then we analyzed the, them for cardinalide content. But, but we also did a sample of, we measured the cardinalide in the butterflies in Massachusetts. This is the same slide you saw before, and 50% of them were emetic, whereas by the time they get to Mexico, the butterflies have excreted some of this toxin, and only 10% are emetic. So a good half of the butterflies are pretty close to being palatable or with small amounts of cardinalide in them. So the opportunity there is for the birds to exploit the ones that are low in cardinalide, and that is exactly what the Oriole does. It strips the abdomen, it tastes the butterfly if it's bitter, and we, so, we, we measured the cardinalide. The ones that had these strips and were intact had high cardinalides. The ones that were completely stripped had low cardinalides. So they were eating the non-toxic butterflies. It turns out that the gross beak was much less sensitive to the cardinalides than the Oriole, so they could actually tolerate quite a bit of poison in their bodies. So the next issue of, of getting through the winter is, is the winter. And we had no idea when we first, here we were south of the, of the Tropic of Cancer, tending out up in the mountains. We didn't think we were gonna get snowstorm. And in 1981, we had this massive snowstorm and it came through and it snowed and rained for several days, sleet and snow. Millions of butterflies were knocked down. If they were covered with snow, they were probably okay. And what Bill and I discovered was that what is really endangers the butterflies is if it, they get rained on and are wet, and then it clears early in the morning when the temperature goes precipitously down below freezing, that kills the butterflies. And if, they're left, if they manage to not get back into the colony and they're out exposed to the frost at night, that will also kill them. So the frosting is another way in which they die. And in 2002, the, the worst storm that we encountered over the 20 years or so that we've been going down there occurred, and 75% of all the butterflies were killed. And we figured that more than half a million monarch butterflies were frozen to death in that storm. And this was how we actually figured out there are 50 million butterflies per hectare because what we did was we counted the number of dead butterflies under the trees, and on average there was 5,000 per square meter. There were so many dead butterflies on the ground that in some places they were up to your thigh in piles of dead butterflies. I mean, it was really incredible. So the two scientific um, findings were, were we were able to get a much better handle on the, the we had way underestimated the number of butterflies in the first place. And secondly, we learned out what is really precarious for these butterflies. And uh, 
So it was, a, we got a lot of valuable information out of that storm in terms of under, so then my graduate student at the University of Florida, Jim Anderson, and another student at Sweetbriar College, Tamara, started studying the temperature at which these butterflies, act, how much, how cold can it get? How, how, how much can they tolerate? And basically, this is an amazingly simple uh, assay. You take a butterfly and you put a little wire probe on it that measures the body temperature of the butterfly. And the wire probe runs out to your computer so you can measure the body temperature of the butterfly. Then you put the butterfly in a tube and you cork it with the wire coming out and you drop the temperature in a, in a uh, water bath, in a, in a freezing bath. And as the temperature goes down, 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 when the butterfly freezes, it releases heat, heat of, uh, of crystallization. And that heat can be easily measured with that probe. So you could tell as you drop the temperature, the first butterfly froze at about minus eight degrees below freezing centigrade. And this one got down to minus 16 before it froze. And if you look at this in a population point of view, as you drop the temperature down, 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 as it goes down, more and more butterflies are dying. And one way of looking at this is at what point is 50% of the butterflies being killed? And 50% is about minus eight, eight degrees below freezing if they're dry. If they are wet, and Jin discovered this, they lose most of their cryoprotection and they start freezing much more quickly. And instead of 50% getting to tolerating it to minus eight, they can only tolerate it to down to minus three or four. So, the, so a, a stormy period with snow, wetting the butterflies, and then early morning clearing, super temperature drop on the wet butterflies. That's the disastrous set of circumstances. So dry butterflies can survive long periods. We also found that out. You can hold them at minus eight. That's 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Wet butterflies are at risk below four degrees and they lose complete mortality at six degrees below freezing. So we were really interested in learning more about the, te thermal, the thermal dynamics of, all of, of the colony and, and how the butterflies are adapted to it. And as technology has advanced, are you familiar with these little gizmos? They're called thermocrons. So they're little tiny miniature temperature devices that measure the temperature every hour for three months and then you just download them and you got, and then they came up with a super, another better one that also measured the relative humidity every hour. So we were able to use those things. And what's really nice about them is that unlike these gadgets, which are very obvious and get stolen, we could put the thermocron on a little black post and you could hardly even see it. And so we were get a lot more data from these. And then we set up weather station. We also put these little thermocrons inside of PVC pipe and hoisted it up in the tree and measure the temperature at different elevations up as you go up to see if there is there an optimal temperature range in the forest that the butterflies are exploiting and I bet you already know the answer to that. that Whatever is good, the butterflies seem to know it. Well, this gives you an idea of the cold temperature at night. Um, it, it goes down below freezing almost every night during the winter doesn't go super down. The worst it ever got was about minus nine. And this is out in the open. It's not inside the forest. And this is the daytime temperature, which is around 20. And what is really interesting about that is how stable it is. And the, the flight threshold of monarch butterflies is slightly below, uh, right around 15 degrees centigrade. And so the butterflies have picked an area in that forest where the temperature is perfect. So if they do get knocked out of the trees, they can shiver and fly back into them. So micro benefits of the canopy for the overwintering monarchs are there are thermal advantages to being under the canopy. The canopy is a blanket. <coughs> being in the middle of a cluster, it's a little bit warmer. A clustering on tree trunks. Now, any excuse that you can possibly think of not to cut down a tree is in my book. And the bigger the tree, the less likely you want to cut it down. And for the monarch butterfly, think of the tree trunk as a hot water bottle. 
the fluctuating temperature is going on, but the tree trunk is stable temperature. And if a cold period comes, the trunk is gonna be a hot water bottle holding the heat and protecting the butterflies during the minimum temperatures. And that is exactly what happens. And clustering at intermediate heights. So we'll look at these things. This shows a comparison inside the forest, it's the ambient inside the forest, and this is the ambient outside the forest in the open area. And you can see that it's about three or four degrees cooler in the forest during the hot part of the day. And it's four or five or six degrees warmer during the nighttime temperatures. So this microclimate protection by the forest is really, really incredible. And does everybody see that? Is it, is it pretty obvious? Here's one of, and so we were able to use these little eye buttons. Again, it's about as big as your thumbnail um, and a stack of maybe five dimes. And we put these thermocrons on dowels and then we lowered the dowels into the, into the cluster very, very carefully. And here there's a, this thermocron is, is exposed to the, the open air, whereas the other ones are inside the cluster. And what we found was that it's about, on, when it gets cold, it's at least a degree warmer inside the middle of the cluster. And during the day, it's about a degree or two degrees uh, cooler inside the cluster. Now, why is being cooler during the day important? Well, it's because monarchs go to Mexico with a huge fat reserve and they burn the fat at the, in proportion to how warm it is. So if it's cooler, they won't burn as much fat and they'll have more energy to fly back to the United States. What we found was the showing that the, the gave us this initial uh, idea that the, the, the tree trunks are hot water bottles is that <clears throat> during this 81 storm, 56% of the butterflies survived if they were on branches and 78% survived on trunks. And in an even colder time, and this is February 92, 5% on the branches and 43% on the trunks. So we have pretty good evidence that when these big storms occur, that those butterflies that are on the tree trunks are in much better shape. And this basically shows this. It's the same graph you saw before, but the trunk is even cooler during the day and much warmer during night. So there is the perfect hot water bottle system. Well, why do monarchs cluster at intermediate heights? And here again, you see them not on the treetops. So we, we strung the, we had about five of these at, at five meter intervals and we strung them up. We had a giant slingshot that was murderous weapon to get the line over the tree as high as we could get it. 30 meters up was about as high as we could get it. And here you can see the string going up and there are these tubes with the, with the thermocrons in it. Here's one, here's another. And what we found was that the temperature near the ground is cold. And then it gets warmer as you go up a degree or two degrees warmer. And the area where the butterflies are is the warmest vertical part of the forest. So once again, the butterflies are so closely adapted. So, we, so this is what we've been talking about and we've been able to, to uh, do data, get decent data publications on each of those projects. So microclimate really does matter and uh, this, these were the sorts of the early observations that Bill and I made that got us on to doing climate research in the first place. Now, the big problem is that microclimate is, is subject to human disturbances. If you disturb the forest, so let's talk about this a little bit. Normal use of the forest probably is, is tolerable. It's a question of numbers that are using it and the extent to which they're using it. And then commercial forest operations, this was very close to the Sierra Chinqua. Um, and so uh, the Mexican government, we, we we've been working on issues of conservation since the day we saw the butterflies. And a lot of people put pressure on the Mexican government and the first 1980 was an absolutely worthless uh, conservation plan. All monarch butterflies everywhere are protected. 
but all that means is he can't study them or look at them or anything else. That wasn't very helpful. Then in 1986, actually based on a plan that Bill and I presented to the Mexican government, we had a core zone which was 4,481 hectares, so like a national forest, like a national park, completely protected, and a buffer zone around that, like a national forest, in which some controlled forestry could be. So, so the, the problem was that people kept cutting the trees down anyway, and it didn't stop, and more and more logging operations were developing in the area and some really big ones in commercial operations. So we got together a group of people um, with working with World Wildlife Fund and uh, working with the U University of Mexico. And these guys are, all, all of us are interested in mapping the history of the forest use over the years. And basically what we did was looked at aerial photographs taken over a period of 30 years or so. And in 1971, uh, the green forest is intact, yellow is partially disturbed, and this is very disturbed. And what you can see is that over the course of the years, 44% of the green forest was lost. And the butterfly area is right in the middle of that. So this one presented to the Mexican government strongly motivated them, and in the year 2000, a new presidential decree increasing the area from 62 square miles to 217 square miles, and tying together the different areas that had butterflies so that they weren't fragmented. It was a, it was a good plan. It w I wish we could have gotten more, but that was the best we could do. But the problem is that uh, logging has continued even after the 2000 decree, and this is an example of individual horse logging where young folks go up with their horses and chainsaws, and they cut individual trees, they bring them down. One of those trees probably worth about 10 or $20. So the motivation is very strong. And th this is the west side of Pelon, and the forest used to look like this, and the horse logging has diminished it to that extent. And I think the area where, er, where uh, Ken and Catalina found the monarch butterflies is probably right about where that arrow is. So this is an historically important area. But I do have some good news. It's naturally regenerating. And so our big push now is not to reforest, but to let it come back naturally. And it's coming back beautifully in that area. So that's, but these illegal operations, this was on one of the main areas in February seven years ago. Can you imagine going into the supposedly core zone of the butterfly area and doing that? Look at that cutting. Well, ecotourism. Last year I had the opportunity to take President Carter to see the butterflies, which was very exciting. And this was on the way up, and it was the effect of tourism on the area, is impact is pretty strong. Here is a sign on the way up to this colony. It says no more than 20 people are allowed in the sanctuary. <laughs> that was the day of the so-called 20 person limitation. So this shows the subtle, this is a big rock that's near the butterflies on the Sierra Chinqua, and that picture was taken in January 1980 when we were just getting into the area. And this is what it looked like in 2007, just from people climbing on that rock, just the impact of it. Well, some good news is that there are attempts to reforest, and this is a group called Altenari, and basically they're teaching people to fish rather than giving them the fish. And that is a very successful operation, a very good group of people involved. And they're teaching people how to be more efficient in using wood, giving them stoves, showing them how to, how to uh, do organic gardening and increase the productivity. And this is the group from Altenari and a man by the name of Jose Luis Alvarez who became a good friend. And he had planted these trees here. This is outside in the buffer zone where the idea is to replant it to stop erosion and to convert it back into forest. And if you have enough trees growing in the buffer zone, then you'll be less pressure on the core zone. That adds a, 
And the trees, the good news is the trees grow really fast if they're properly planted, and Jose is a super expert at doing this. Now, are we doing okay on time? Are we holding up? Okay. All right, I want to talk about loss of milkweeds because this has now become a major issue. Um, this, is, this is at Sweetbriar College in our backyard there, and this is a patch of the common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca, with lots of butterflies. It's a wonderful nectar plant, and uh, monarchs are using that to breed on. Uh, and they, they obtain, not only do they obtain the toxins from eating this plant, but they also, the adults have the opportunity to obtain really good nectar. And nectar is the source of sugar, which is used to be converted into lipids, which is used to fuel all their behavioral activities. And in the fall, as they migrate, <coughs> goldenrod is really important, and other plants. Now, uh, Wassner and Hobson and our research has established that it, this is the area of breeding in the summertime, and 50% of the, they were, by using isotopes, they were able to show that 50% of the monarchs are coming out of the Great Lakes region and in, 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 the, in the Great Plains of the United States in that area. Well, that's going to be a problem. This is where corn is grown extensively overlapping the distribution of the monarch's main breeding area. Man, keeps jumping. And this is soybean and corn distribution. And you can see that these two maps are just about overlapping each other. Now, the problem is industrialized agriculture has now gotten to the point where it's capable of eliminating all competing plants everything, 100% kill. And what you see here are roadsides in Minnesota with milkweeds growing. These are very important, and I think that may be one of the solutions to this whole problem is protecting roadsides. And the, we're in the right spot for that, for sure. It's really nice for me to be here. But we should really push that thing to become a national policy and a county policy right on down. Because I think there's at least four million road, miles of road east of the Rocky Mountains in the United States. So there's a huge opportunity there for protecting milkweed. But this is an example early on. Damn, I keep, I'm sorry, I keep. Uh, you can see this milkweed is dying. It's been sprayed with herbicide. And, um, and John Pleasance, who with Karen Oberhauser, has shown that something like 70 to 80 percent of milkweed has been eliminated from the entire state of Iowa. And John gave me these slides. This is a soybean. These are, these are milkweeds growing in a soybean. These are so rows of soybean, grass, weeds, soybean, milkweeds. And this is at seven days afterwards, after spraying once with gly glyphosate. I can't believe what this stuff does. It's killed all the grass, the milkweeds are dying. And, and here the, the uh, genetically engineered soybeans are completely resistant to this incredible toxin. And here you see the milkweed is completely gone. John also gave me the next slide. He did a, sorry. Um, these are, he, did a, he did a study in a field which was sprayed and he followed the spray from July middle of June on through to the 18th of August. And these are, these are, don't worry about that. That's just another way of showing a calendar. Um, the number of milkweed stems started out 140 glyphosate applied on the 28th of June. Within about 10 days, the, the milkweeds are just going, 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 gone. Kills almost 100% of the milkweeds in those fields. <laughs> that, somebody wrote me a letter and said, how can I get funds to work on the Roundup Ready milkweed? <laughs> well, it, it, this is an example of, I, I say that I'm standing on the deck of the Normandy looking across the Atlantic Ocean at soybeans and not a single weed in the entire picture with one exception. What do you suppose that weed is? Aha, uh -huh, that was what I hope you'd say. It's a genetically engineered corn plant from the previous planting. <laughs> it's 
So the only survivor was one corn seed. And as a result of this, we think that the decline in the number of monarchs, which is going down in the last decade or so, it's been really dropping, 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 dropping. And we were hoping they were going to come back this year, but this year hit the lowest numbers ever, less than, less than a hectare of monarch butterfly. So, and if you plot the rate at which glyphosate has been increasingly used in agriculture. Now, if this is lung cancer and this is smoking tobacco, the two things are correlated. We're going to have the same battle with Monsanto, who's going to say you can't prove that what we're doing is, is killing off the monarch butterfly. So we're getting ready for that battle. But the, the, cor the, the negative correlation between the increase of these and you know, I went on the internet the other day. Do you know how many pesticides are used in the United States, commercial pesticides? 450. And this is what you can find this in the USGS information database. I mean, what the hell are all those things doing to us as well as the butterflies? I think it's a catastrophic uh, um, agriculture. So. <laughs> Well, nature is resilient. We have to end on a high note, right? <laughs> and we have a lot of, today's students are going to be tomorrow's problem solvers. We've had lots of colleagues who have been really involved with us over the years. It's been a great ride. I think I need to be trained with these things. <laughs> is that your daughter in the upper left? Uh, upper left, let me see. Oops, well now I'm really getting wound up here. Up here? No, 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 one more back. One more back. No, they, these were students. These were okay. former. It, it had the name Brower. Oh, oh, that was my first wife. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we had all these wonderful people working with us over the years. And, uh, So we've had a lot of good support from many different groups, and we really appreciate all that, to say the least. And this is, the, this is at the end of the season in Mexico when they're getting really, really active. And you get these polyulating clouds of monarch butterflies that are just so marvelous. And here they are on the way back to the U.S. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Right. Onward and upward with the monarch. <laughs>